Welcome back, everyone, to Neighbors in the Network. I'm James Pinedo, your host. Today, I'm joined with a very special guest, Andrea Keith, the Executive Director of Let Grow. Andrea, thank you so much for joining me today. You are so welcome, James. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so excited as well. Can you tell me more, though? Well, let me see. Let me start off by saying Let Grow is an amazing organization that I've been so excited to learn about because, you know, I have three young kids, three under three, as I like to say. Oh. And we are I'm just reading about Let Grow's mission and thinking about, you know, bring, like, oh, how can I implement that for my children and how amazing this whole program is. So it's been such a pleasure to research this for, for for in preparation for this podcast, Andrea, and I'm so excited. But can you tell me before we dive in about Let Grow and the amazing stuff that you all are doing there, which actually won an Ed Prize here yeah. for SPN, which you know we 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 had so many wonderful applicants and and Let Grow really stood out, and so we're so excited about about your mission as as a whole in our organization. Tell me more about you though. How did you come? to be where you are now, what's, wow. your, what's your background? That's, <laughs> it's, it, that's a, it's such an uh, uh, interesting question. And, and I think um, when I think back to childhood, because obviously that's what we're about, uh, and you bring everything that you've been through as, your, as a child yourself, so determines who you are and your personality and, uh, and what you do in the world as an adult. And I can say that the first really interesting thing about me is that I have lived all over the country. Um, as a kid, uh, my I was not a military child. That's the first question I always get. Uh, but my father sold glass, which uh, glass as in float glass, which is what you make buildings and, th and windshields and bus windows out of. So um, that meant that we were moved around the country frequently for you know promote uh him either being promoted or switching companies because the, there was a lot of building happening someplace else so i went to two elementary schools two junior highs and um two high schools uh in the course of my of my childhood career and that took me from michigan all the way across the country ultimately to california where i ended up going to college so i've had these amazing experiences um of starting over mm, not always fun at the time but but often i look back and i'm really glad i had had a chance to maybe kind of leave that click i was in in minnesota um and realize that i didn't really like those girls. So moving was a, was a good option. Um, and, uh, it just, it just really made me very, um, resilient to change mm. and resilience is something that is sorely lacking in a lot of our kids today. Uh, so the fact that I, I had these opportunities and it was kind of sink or swim, I suppose I could also have become very anxious, withdrawn and introverted, uh, but it was more a matter of, okay, here I am, uh, bloom where you're planted as Mary Engelbright, uh, has, has said, I, that's kind of my motto. Um, then, uh, as an adult, I went to school and I ended up, uh, majoring in education, not my first choice. I was going to be a business major and learn how to speak Japanese. Because in the in the eighties when I was in school, uh, Japan was was the real powerhouse and and everything. Of course, now I I'd, I'd be upset because I should have learned Chinese. But anyway, point being, um, I did not stick with that. I instead switched to education, and uh, became an elementary school teacher. Uh, but I had the really fortunate opportunity of being a stay at home mom for ten years. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I met in college. We got married right after I graduated and I substitute taught for a little bit and then immediately got pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had our kids. We had our kids very young, uh, not under 20 something. We were married, but still fairly, fairly young. First amongst our peer group and being a stay at home mom uh, really allowed me to be present with my kids to, um, you know, to be there. But at the same time, I very much took my 
my growing up as an 80s kid that ran around all day and mom didn't know where I was and I didn't have a cell phone and come home when the street lights are on. Um, so we, uh, you know, my husband and I were pretty intentional about giving our kids a lot of freedom. Uh, it also helped that we were young enough not to know better. <laughs> there's, mm. there's an advantage to having children young because you're not as smart. You don't have as much money. You don't have just a whole, your worldview is just completely different. Mm. We didn't know what we were doing and we knew we didn't know what we were doing. And we were comfortable with not knowing what we were doing. Um so from there, I went into I went into teaching and I was able to teach elementary school. We continued to move a lot, though. My husband and I have have now since moved from California a couple of times all the way across to the East Coast and back. And now we live in Las Vegas. Um, so we uh, we had a lot of great opportunities and I loved teaching elementary school. Um and then we made a move and I moved to normal Illinois. If 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 your listeners uh, aren't familiar, uh, there actually is a town called normal <laughs> Illinois. That's where ISU is. And ISU is a teaching college. So if you didn't weren't aware, the word normal used to mean teaching. So it was a normal normal Illinois was named. Anyway, um, I couldn't get a job. So it was it was it was hard to get a job. They were cranking out hundreds of brand new teachers coming out looking for jobs. And while I had great credentials, I'd worked on the Colorado State writing test and, you know, had had tenure and everything in Colorado. That mean, meant they had to pay me more in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And so I, I pretty much blame that for for my exit from education as I, I could not find a teaching job and I ended up working for an education technology company. Mm. Well, the cool thing about the education technology company was they hired me because I was a teacher and uh, they had tools for kids to use. This is before Google was, had Google apps even didn't exist. And this, this company had email for kids and we had digital lockers um, and all this stuff that was very cutting edge at the time. Um, and, and so I was a teacher trainer and got to grow up with that company. Uh, of course, then Google came out with Google apps, which are free and everybody jumped on those and it's really hard to sell against free. So we had to make some adjustments in that company, but I was with them for 11 years. And, uh, I think we had 10 employees when I started, we were very much a startup. Um, and I got to kind of grow with the company and develop a lot of different things. And. It fit because I was still working on empowering kids. It was still about children. And I felt like I was using my teaching uh, credential, even though I wasn't in a classroom. And from there, I ended up leaving there because I got decided that I needed something different to do. And I worked uh, briefly in two different ed tech companies, uh, one from Canada that had digital portfolios um, and another one that taught a process of innovation, which was fascinating unfortunately didn't realize when when we went there that basically the money was almost all gone um, and so so both of those companies actually went under uh mm. and I was laid off that's when I found my grow um I can't tell you how exciting it was to find them uh after being unemployed for four months uh because I didn't really want to be a salesperson and everybody thought that's where I should be so mm. Uh, happened to find Let Grow on a website called Ed Surge, uh, which they had posted for a school salesperson. And uh, I applied. They adjusted the, the job to the vice president of school programs uh, because I sent them a, you know, a task and kind of they realized that, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> mm. she's got some better background than just calling schools and asking if they want to use the free program. So again, I, I really feel it's a long story because there's a lot to tell, but it everything I've done in my career has been about empowering kids. Uh, and so Let Grow was just this really amazing fit that inspired me the same way you got inspired looking into it. I didn't know who they were when I first filled out that application. And when I started looking at it and 
that was three websites ago, by the way. Um, it really wasn't much uh, compared to what we've got today. But I was like, oh, my gosh, yes, yes, this makes so much so much sense. I've got to be involved with this. And here I am. What a, what a, like, it seems like a, a treasure you uncover, like you're going through all these and you just, it's like glowing in the horizon. Like, oh, wait, this looks <laughs> Yeah, great. I didn't always feel that positive, but uh, there's been a lot of stress in, uh, along the ways. And, and let me tell you, moving is not fun. Uh, mm. Although it's much easier when you're a kid and don't have to deal with all of the yeah. logistics. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's true of any child, um, all of these things form who we end up becoming and how we evolve as a person. Yep. And I think I'm incredibly fortunate that I've been able to keep kind of this core belief in empowering kids throughout my career, because mm. that's, that's a blessing. Yeah. I see that core there. And, and that makes a lot of sense um, as a thorough line of your story. But mm -hmm. I also see some huge shifts that you have here. So it starts off, you're going from being, you know, you're thinking you're going to be in education to saying, no, no, I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom. That seems like a shift. And then you have another shift where you're a stay-at-home mom and then you go into education, right? You go, you jump into, that's that seems like a shift as well. And then you have a shift from being in education to working in a tech startup, which seems like another huge shift. And then yeah. the tech startup is a for-profit and you have a new shift where, you know, you're working in tech startups, tech startups, and then you jump into a non, like let grow is, is, is not a for-profit as far as I can tell. So. No, we are definitely a nonprofit. Right. And the funny thing with that is I was hired to be the school programs person. And then we had a reduction in force uh, about a year after the pandemic started. The schools were all shut down right after I was hired. I thought I'd, I thought I'd be the first to go, honestly, because I'm like the schools are closed. I I can't I can't call superintendents right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, it, it kind of worked out that it hit a, it hit our organization about a year late. We we secured some some good funding, and then it was kind of after that after 2020 that funding we thought we had secured for the future fell through um, for a lot of good reasons. People needed to eat and people were giving money elsewhere. Um, and I suddenly became the executive director. So uh, that's when I really had to learn about nonprofits mm. uh, and uh, and all of the operational things. I think I think you're right. I hadn't thought about them as being major shifts. I, I look at them as more opportunities for learning. Sure. I thrive on change, having grown up the way I did. I love change. Uniquely love prepared. <laughs> Uniquely yeah, I prepared. get bored easily. Mm. So, um, so, so having jobs that that allow me to suddenly learn a bunch of things because I have to mm. uh, has worked well for me. But tell me more though about some of the, because it strikes me as it couldn't all be sunshine and roses. Like when you're making these huge shifts, <laughs> tell me a little bit more about the challenges you face. Like, so let's start with sh shifting from being a, a stay-at-home mom to working in education. What were some of, like, what was the mental shifts that you had to make? You know, I think um, I, I was, I, I had a little bit of a transition because I, um, the kids were little uh, and it was about my son was in kindergarten mm -hmm. um, and my daughter is three years older. So she would have been third grade and we moved. It, there's nothing like a geographical move mm. to, to kind of push a shift. As, mm -hmm. as you're, you know, if you're going to call them a shift, yeah, they, they kind of forced a shift. Yep. Um, we moved because my husband's company, Target at the time, paid for us to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back when they paid very well to move people. <laughs> so, so it's kind of like, you don't say no. Mm. And I had a background, as my husband does too, of moving around as a child. So I didn't even consider saying no. And uh, I had done a whole lot of, I'd become that mom as a stay at home mom, I was, I was that, I was the classroom helper mm. um, that the teachers, of course, just, you know, you, they had my daughter Jenny in their class and it meant they got me. Uh, and having been an, ed, you know, I was a certified educator. So it's like having a second teacher in the classroom. I could do a lot more than the average 
uh, mom helper. Mm -hmm. uh, although I do remember cutting out a lot of cereal boxes and turning them into journals with uh, with um, those wrapped bindings. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of had done some of that. So I was getting some school exposure. When we moved to Colorado, um, I initially thought, okay, my son's in school all day, my youngest. So, you know, I should, maybe I should go get a part-time job or something. I started out as, go, went back to substitute teaching mm -hmm. because substitute teaching is a perfect job for a stay-at-home mom. It, you know, you don't have to worry about finding the daycare if, if my son was sick. I didn't work. Mm -hmm. I wasn't available that day to, to, to take a sub job. And so in a lot of ways, um, my my career getting back in fell into my lap. I, I ended up subbing uh, at a couple of places in this tiny little town we lived in. Uh, word got around quick that there was an experienced substitute. There's never enough substitutes. So if you're if you're good at it, they <laughs> they keep you busy. Mm -hmm. And I think it was my second day subbing that the principal asked if I would fill in for a maternity leave that was coming up that mm -hmm. they didn't have anybody for. So I jumped into fourth grade for the last three months of that school year. And that teacher decided not to come back. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up taking her place. And I mean, mm -hmm. it's just some of, some of it was serendipity um, and some of it just kind of happened. And the beauty of that too, was it was, it was the school that my son went to. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's really easy when you kind of have all those things fall into place. Um, it was, it was tough because teaching takes a lot of time, um, outside of, outside of the school day. Uh, and so that was certainly a transition. I think probably the hardest part about that transition had more to do with my husband and less to do with the kids. Mm -hmm. Um, because, we kind of shifted some of the some of the responsibilities that, you know, I, I was no longer the stay at home mom who also because he worked retail 60 hours a week and some crazy hours, you know, I took care of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say there was probably some conflict for at least a year in making that uh, that mm -hmm. adjustment between the two of us. But uh it worked. And then I think that the, the other shift was then out of, of teaching. There was a lot, there were, there were multiple steps along the way when I felt like we were big into mental health. Now we weren't quite as much back then, but where I felt kind of um, desperate and depressed because, you know, things weren't working out or we'd move. I had no friends and then I'd have to kind of reestablish myself. Um, but uh the biggest the biggest thing that was hard was was when I ended up leaving teaching because I felt very much that I was forced out. Um, you know, it was something that I was doing well at was, you know, getting my feet under me felt confident about and to not be able to get a job and, and feel like nobody I couldn't even get interviews, mm. could not even get interviews. Um, and I that that hurts, <laughs> right? Yeah. That hurts. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of my sense of self-worth was kind of suffering uh, when I happened to find this, believe it or not, newspaper ad in the classifieds in 2000, which already in the classifieds was you know, a little bit not the norm uh, for this education technology company. It said educator wanted in this tiny little town of normal Illinois. Well, Bloomington's next to it, but it's still small in the middle of cornfields. And that was, again, for me, was like, oh, my gosh, this is my dream job. Um, went through the interviews. It was down to two of us. I'm really happy that I got it. Um, and there began another brand new challenge of figuring things out uh, without any. Um, I do a lot of building airplanes while they're flying. Is ah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was that was tough. And the and the transition, then the two other jobs that I did, it is hard looking for a job. Mm. That is really it, it, it it's hard on your psyche. Um and uh and, and you question yourself a lot. Uh and the the transition from the um 
the uh, entrepreneurial curriculum company, uh, that was a sudden get up on Monday morning and, oh, by the way, you're fired. We're closing. Um, you know, so there's no th there's no mental preparation for that. And and so four and a half months, I actually, you know, was on unemployment. Um, and, and that's really demoralizing. Uh, I had to go to these meetings and I had to go to this training for this, you know, the state says, well, if you're on employment, you have to go to this training. And I sat in this training and, and all I kept thinking was, this is ridiculous. I could teach this better than this person. And, mm. and, and I don't need to be reminded that I should take a shower before I go to a job interview. But apparently enough people do need that reminder. Oh my. <laughs> so, so finding Lecro was, uh, was was really just kind of a, a, a wonderful thing. And um, uh, it's been so much fun. Yeah. It's been hard. Right. Don't let me tell you, it's not been hard. That year learning how to be an executive director uh, was extraordinarily challenging because I did not have experience in finance. Mm. Uh, previous jobs and startups, we had people who owned the company who didn't believe in budgets. So I hadn't even had to, you know, work within a budget. And all of a sudden, I'm like, here's QuickBooks. Oh, and we're a nonprofit. So here's here's the audit. <laughs> oh my. So I would say that I that I that I probably drank more than I should have that first year. <laughs> <laughs> but I got through it. <laughs> I love it. Is it the analogy you used is building a plane while it's flying. Yes. And that's what that's what you used while you were in the tech startup. Does that that mentality follow through well and let grow? Absolutely. Mm. Uh, in fact, in some ways, even better because let grow, we're in our sixth year. But we kind of it, it feels like it feels like as an organization, we kind of stalled a little bit and took a little bit of a step backwards because of the pandemic. Um, and, and that in, a, in some ways forced kind of a reevaluation of the direction Lecro was going in the way of messaging and branding and things like that. Um, so very much have had to figure out as I go, uh, I've worn a million hats. Uh, and so, uh, in the early, especially the first year, uh, Second year too. This year, this year's this year's smoother. Um, but uh, I was the marketing person. I was the HR person. I was, you know, basically I did anything that was operational. And Lenore Skenazy, our wonderful co-founder and president, um, is is great. But she's the visionary. She's the inspiration. Mm -hmm. And at, she'll tell. I think she's allergic to dollar signs. <laughs> um, she definitely doesn't want to have anything to do with with anything operational and, and spreadsheet wise and that kind of stuff. So um, so all of this was pretty much dropped in my lap. But uh, the good thing about that kind of trial by fire and building the plane while I while we're flying it um, forced me to learn some things so that now that we are in a little bit better place, we're getting better funding. Um, and I've gotten a lot of uh, technology put into place to automate as much as I can. Uh, I'm now in a place where when I'm able to hire somebody, and I just hired our school programs director, uh, which is our third full time person, uh, the rest of them are con our contracts, uh, contractors, I I'm in a place where I feel, okay, I know enough about that position to, to make hopefully a good hire and to be able to manage somebody doing that, which sometimes I think if you go in, if you go through a kind of an executive level and you just are always in leadership uh, and in larger companies, you are really good at managing people, hopefully, but you don't necessarily know the details of the jobs they're doing. Mm. And so I feel like having that, knowledge. Now I'm in that place where what my goal is, is when I get to make a hire, I'm hiring somebody smarter and better than me at that specialty. Um, and I can have the confidence in letting them, you know, kind of let go and let grow. I have the same philosophy as a, as a leader. 
I love it. That makes complete sense to me. It makes me think a little bit of, uh, I'm a big fan of, of movies. And I think of Alfred Hitchcock. And he said he would never want to make a movie or he didn't understand what the price of bread would be in the town that it's made, you know, that he's that he's making the movie in. And that's similar to, you know, you know, yeah. like what it takes for these all these different hats because you've had to wear them. And mm -hmm. now you can really hone in on what you what this position needs. I love absolutely, it. absolutely. And it's and it's just so much fun because I'm still as much as where things are much are are smoother we've got so many things in place we're just blowing up right now um in the way of uh attention you know we had a new york times article come out uh on a um, study we had a child psychologist used the independence project uh as a uh tr clinical treatment for kids with anxiety and it was better better results than cbt and that's getting us a whole lot of attention, which means a whole lot more schools using our programs, mm -hmm. which we have um, expanded and, and made bigger. So it's really exciting to be in a place where we're getting so much positive press. We are poised or at the beginning of, of just potentially explosive growth mm -hmm. uh, and and to feel good about having some money to to build the things up so that so that we can support that kind of growth and still be a bit of a startup mentality. Mm -hmm. um, Let Grow does not intend to become a giant nonprofit. We don't we don't want to be the United Way or Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, and I think one of the things we've been able to do is really hone in with the board as to what our mission is. Mm. who our audience is, which by the way, not everybody will realize, but our audience is not children. Our audience is adults mm. and parents. Ultimately, the children benefit, but children don't get to decide what they're allowed to do. So we need to change parents and get them, get the adults to step back so kids can step up. Uh, and so it's exciting to be in a, to be in a place where um, I'm working with a lot more strategy. As a matter of fact, that's my big job for the end of this year is a new three to five year strategic plan mm -hmm. uh, for let grow. And um, so it's fun because, because for me being someone who gets bored, this position allows me to be constantly doing something different mm. uh, and, and learning. I'm constantly learning. So uh, yeah, it's fun. I love it, but it's not always like those challenges you mentioned are real. So tell me though, yes. what keeps you going when you run up against all these challenges? Any inspiration? Oh, I have, you know, I have to, I, I will admit that working at a nonprofit can be, it can be difficult emotionally. Um, and, and so I do tend, you're catching me at a good time. Um, but there are times that I have been, just really down in the dumps uh, and, you know, question, mm. can I, can I do this? You know, am I making a difference? That's something in a nonprofit uh, that you can run up against uh, fairly frequently. There are so many things going on in the world uh, that every once in a while, it's kind of like, oh gosh, why am I worrying about whether kids get to play when there are people dying, you know, on other in 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 wars in other countries, yeah. or um, seeing something come out? Uh, one of the things that we that we kind of try to fight against is facts and data. Uh, there's too much fear in this country, and parents seem to think that their their kids are at huge risk for being abducted. It is just not true. Mm. And um, so the idea that there's a white van at the end of every cul-de-sac or some bad character at the end of every aisle at Target waiting, just waiting for that opportunity to snatch your child is a complete myth. Um, and so we try to fight against that. And yet at the same time, we understand that it's an emotional response and and we don't blame parents for feeling that way and our meat feeds that so for instance the the child that was abducted uh suddenly i can't remember her name um 
just a few just just a few weeks ago she was at a campsite and she was 13 i want to say she was like 13 or 11 and she rode around the and, and all of a sudden there was an amber alert one of two in the entire country they found her and it was some guy who somehow convinced her and had and had her in a in a mobile home um she was okay but anytime i see something like that on the news i just feel like uh it 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 it's going to be blown out of proportion, and now we're going to have to fight even harder um, to get people to understand that you can't keep your kids home on the couch twenty four seven to protect them from the outside world without it having consequences. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think it's the mental it's the mental stress, and at those times, luckily, we have each other on our staff kind of when when Lenore starts feeling like maybe we're not making headway or she hears a story that you know that just sets her off like oh we're really impressed that kid folded towels for their like her project um when what Lenore wants them to do is you know ride their bike around the block I'm like yeah baby steps you got to meet them where they're at but when she's down usually I'm not and when I'm down usually she's not um and uh we also have the fortune of having like just random emails from people. Thank you so much. I can't believe, you know, I can't believe the difference this made or a teacher saying, I had three parents come up to me thanking me for assigning this project because they didn't realize their kids were so capable. Uh, uh, or, or the one that really got, we got them that give me goosebumps or make me teary too. Most recently we had um, a principal tell us that, a mom stopped him in the hallway, someone who like is usually really quiet and said, I have to tell you, you've changed our lives because my daughter turned in a fake project. So she said she made cookies or something because that's what a lot of kids do at, at the beginning is, is make is make food. But she actually at eight years old started sleeping in her own bed. Hmm. She didn't want people to know. She didn't want her classmates to know that that's what she really did, but that's what happened. And it was the assigning of this, of this very simple, do something different on your own without your parents kind of thing. Um, that was the spark that lit that. And so everyone, we get enough of those stories that kind of brings back some faith in what you're doing and makes you feel good. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love the dynamic that you described where you're bringing every, you're, that workplace environment is bringing everyone up. You know, it's like you, you need to encourage each other when times get tough and you, you run into tough times. It's going to happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I also, I, but I'm so glad you brought it up because I'm a parent, three under three, like I mentioned. And I um, was conflicted as I was reading all this wonderful stuff because I want to apply all of these great things, these great ideas that you guys uh -huh. are talking about. Like, you know, I love that what you just spoke about, that, you know, do something that you haven't done on your own and, and do it on your own. And that makes me think back to my childhood where, you know, I was the oldest of six. So oh, I, was, wow. I was very motivated to get out of the house. <laughs> and and just do, you know, things on my own. And, you know, I had generally would have my little brother with me and we'd be, you know, go out riding bikes in our trailer park and, you know, just mm -hmm. like getting into all sorts of trouble. And, and just, you know, it was <laughs> my wife would say now to an extraordinary degree, you know, charting my own course in childhood and figuring out what I can do on my own. Like if I wanted to well, do something. And at the same time, you had huge responsibility if you were yep. the oldest too. You did oh, a yeah. whole lot of, you know, just that example. You you had to figure out how to go be on your own, but you were watching out for the little brother. Oh, he wasn't yeah. going to get in trouble with, you know, or too much trouble. Right. Exactly. A lot of that. <laughs> a lot. Exactly. You, you're a hundred percent accurate. And so I think about that with my kids and, you know, wanting to instill that. But then at the same time, I'm also like, well, the world has changed so much, you know, like that whole tugging at your at your mind. And yeah. I'm fully convinced that my kids can ride around their bikes in their neighborhood, no problem. But I also can see people li who live in neighborhoods that aren't, aren't as nice as ours. Like, what what about what about that? You know, what what if a parent is is just like, well, the world is too dangerous? How do you how do you how do you answer that? You know, um, yes, the world is dangerous. Uh, we statistically, I can show you the facts that say that it was more dangerous 
at, to be a kid. Um, and crime rates have gone down in general. Abductions, you know, just don't happen like they did. Um, even even NICMIC, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who put all of the kids' faces on the uh, milk cartons um, and kind of started some of the panic because you saw it every day. Therefore, it must be happening a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, those milk cartons never you know, you didn't realize that 95% of those kids were abducted by a family member or somebody they knew, uh, as opposed to some random stranger. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, uh, you know, we, we hear all of this, we see this. And because we have a 24 seven news cycle, yeah. because with with the internet, we have constant we're constantly getting news. And yet, I think most people realize that a lot of the news that we're getting is skewed. There's a lot of effort, not just by by media, but by companies who are trying to make money. Um, they want to keep your eyes on the screen mm -hmm. or get you to click mm -hmm. and fear sells. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we don't see when we see the the notice of a child not making it home from school. Uh, we don't see the other 6 million kids did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I think what's happened in our society is that we've become very risk averse. Right. Um, and that's not bad. This is the thing. It's, we all have really good intentions. You want to protect your kids. Of course you want to protect your kids. Um, but we've lost sight of the fact that the goal of parenting is to create capable adults. Mm -hmm. And we have not figured out that um, we have not figured out that we are unintentionally um, kind of stifling our kids, mm -hmm. slowing down their development, and not providing all of the opportunities for success, for little successes, for little wins, uh, that build up the self-confidence and the resilience so that when they do hit something that's truly hard, mm -hmm. um, they're ready for it, or, or they at least figure, I can figure this out, I will figure this out, I will be okay. Um, and so it's a matter of, I think, educating parents uh, to the realities. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of just trying to, to, to open up a perspective that the risks that you allow your child to take have huge benefits, that they're necessary for learning, that they're necessary for development. And the reason kids are failing to launch, can't handle college, mm -hmm. um, you know, moving back home and living living there till they're 36 or whatever, mm -hmm. a lot of that has to do with the fact that they didn't get the traditional childhood mm -hmm. that nature or God intended mm -hmm. to develop the into the adults that we need. And so if they don't have those experiences and then all of a sudden we think some magic switch flips at 18 yeah. and suddenly they're going to be capable or 21 or whatever magic age we think there is. Uh, and then we realize that, Oh shoot. I, I maybe, 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 maybe should have let them take some of those risks younger and yeah. they'd be more prepared. Yeah. I, you're making so much sense to me. I, what I hear is, it's it's a it's a risk management. It's a it's a cost benefit yes. scenario where you, yes. you you don't want your your children to be ill equipped for life. Like mm -hmm. and that's a recipe for a miserable adult. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't protect them into mis. You don't want to protect them into misery, right? Um, it's something I think about a lot. Actually, is okay. What's I, I think of it. In a, in a very, you know, story sense. I'm, I'm, I think of myself as a storyteller. And so I think of it mm -hmm. in a story way. Like, so is some, is the, what are the right of passage for our children? Where they, you know, they're stretching themselves more yes. and they're putting themselves in a position where it could be maybe dangerous, but, you know, they need this in order to, to be able to stretch into this new parts of life. It's so exciting to hear that there's an organization 
like let grow. <laughs> that's that's their mission, you know, is is to help. Absolutely, help our mission. And I think, um, you know, the the Let Grow project, Let Grow Experience, our school programs, uh, and we've had an independence kit, which is kind of the Let Grow project for parents. So it's it's available to anybody who wants it for free. Um, the idea of that is is to kind of I hate to say it. I'll go. I'll do this for your audience trick parents in a way <laughs> to stepping back because because it's a homework assignment mm. i mean it takes very little class time this isn't anything that that, that takes a teacher teaching they don't teach anything they just mm. send off the homework assignment uh and we've got a wonderful parent letter that kind of you know explains why and you know we're we're, we're building a lot of the parent um education in there and the goal is simply to get them to step back once for most parents the first project is a revelation even mm -hmm. if it's something as simple as baking cookies and no mom you cannot help mm -hmm. um because most of them get this wonderful aha the joy of seeing your child accomplish something and be proud of themselves that light that's what parenting is you know, that's the good stuff, right? Those mm -hmm. are the, those are the moments we live for as parents is to mm -hmm. see your child, the light bulb go on or mm -hmm. the, or the joy in their faces. Um, and so usually that happens within the first, the first project. Uh, and sometimes that might take to the second because maybe they were a little too restrictive on the first one, mm -hmm. but all it takes is that kind of those baby steps to let them have more and more independence. Um, and what it really does for parents is it changes their perspective. Mm. You already, you're there. You got it from our website. You've, you, you've, you've recognized that, oh, okay, I need to think about your cost benefit analysis is a great way to put it. Um, so, you know, if I tell my child, no, you can't do that. It's too dangerous. Oh, by the way, we're constantly telling our kids that. And sometimes it is true, but we got to be careful if they hear it too often, then they internalize it too much. But you say, no, that's, are you saying it's dangerous because it's truly too dangerous or because it's inconvenient mm -hmm. um, or messy or, you know, what, what recognizing when you have those choices to make in the moment that sometimes, oh, can't really think of a reason why not. That was my parents' big philosophy. It's like we'd ask to do something and they'd be like, they might be nervous about it. They might not be real excited, but if they couldn't come up with a good reason, why not? Mm -hmm. Then we generally got a yes. So I think, I think it's changing that perspective. But the other program we have that we haven't even touched on is our play club. Mm. Uh, part of all of this is not just the independence of childhood. It's, uh unstructured free play particularly in mixed age groups because that was the other big thing that most of us grew up with in previous generations was a, a level of freedom you played with whomever was available in your neighborhood mm -hmm. uh you learned how to negotiate and get along you had to figure out what you made up the games you made up the rules you had to negotiate to 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 get everybody happy to keep playing. And you had to do things like um, you learned really important skills like appeasing Joey, who nobody really likes to play with Joey, but he's got the good basketball. So you figure out how to make these or or James, James can play and he's really good but his little brother is going to be here because he has to bring his little brother. So how are we going to negotiate that? That is building the skills we need as an adult. Mm -hmm. And they're missing out on that too. Mm -hmm. And so um, you mentioned the neighborhoods that really are dangerous. There are neighborhoods that you probably shouldn't be out playing in, in front uh, or, or there's no sidewalks or there's, the, you, we're not real good about that stuff. Um, and so play club is kind of our opportunity to give kids the chance to play. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that schools particularly, but boys and girls clubs, churches, any anybody who's who's got programs for kids, uh, but schools, because they've got the playground, can stay open, open early or stay uh, open later. 
and allow kids to play. It's, they generally sign up because they have to sign the pledge, which is there are two rules. You don't hurt another child and you don't leave the premises without permission. Mm. And the parents also are made aware that we're not going to step in because the adults are there purely as lifeguards. So unlike teachers who are taught to roam the playground looking for trouble so you can nip it in the bud and moderate this, this argument and know these are the rules and so it's his turn kind of thing, um, you let the kids play. Mm. Because when kids play, they learn how, mm. how to negotiate. And when they come to a, a teacher and say, so-and-so did such and such, the teacher's answer is not to step in and solve the problem. The teacher's ans answer is something along the lines of, well, what are you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. Or is that a kid problem or an adult problem? If they really have to, they can have like a conflict corner where the kids have to go and, and negotiate, shake hands and go back out and play. But even that doesn't last for long because as soon as the kids realize that the teacher is not going to come solve the problem, they stop going to the teacher. And the teacher's there purely to, you know, if somebody actually gets hurt, obviously the teacher mm -hmm. needs to step in. Mm -hmm. But it's it's really just, it's, it's that opportunity. And it's especially important in neighborhoods where either kids, um, you know, they live in dangerous neighborhoods where they could get shot because they're outside on the streets yeah. or um, rural environments where, you know, they're, they're three miles from the from the nearest kids, so they don't get enough opportunities to to spend with each other. So play club is a is another really important program that actually we're putting a lot of focus on expanding um, and developing it into a much more robust collection of materials uh, for 2024. In the same way we did that for our school program for independence in 2023. That's wonderful. I, I am going to look into this even more, but tell me more. What are other goals and hopes you have for there, the future of Let Grow? Um, so I think that, uh, you know, our, our theory of change is that the more parents that are exposed, not just to the idea, because I can't tell you how many high fives, how many head nods, we get, I've never had a parent say, oh my gosh, no, you are completely wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most people agree with the philosophy and the concept and recognize that their children have much less freedom and independence than they did as a child. Um, and that it would be good for them to have more of those, those opportunities. Um, but what we need to do is not just spread the philosophy, but provide the action steps to take because you don't really break the cycle unless you do something. And so we believe very strongly that the Let Grow project, which is a monthly part of the experience um, curriculum, uh, is crucial and critical. The more people, the more parents who do that, mm -hmm. even if it's only once or twice, that seems to really flip the switch for them and they start looking at their parenting differently and and putting their kids in the opportunities to have those little successes and failures. Yeah. I mean, you've got to look at the... So anyway, uh, sorry, I'm going to digress. I'll just get on my soapbox. Um, uh, so for Let Grow, we're, we're very much in growth mode. Uh, the biggest thing that we feel that we can make the, the biggest impact the fastest is to get the school programs into as many schools as possible. Schools and schools of all kind. Um, we, we're, we're agnostic when it comes to education. Uh, we're, we're in public schools. We're in private schools. Uh, the Ed Prize grant that we got is is going to be used for some uh, to get our program and follow the stories of uh, hopefully a micro school or a charter school and some of these other different types of education that are kind of developing and, and becoming more popular. Um, so the goal is to get it into as many schools as possible so that we meet, uh, get as many parents as possible. For us, it, it, it's a channel. 
Um, mm. It's the fastest place to meet as many parents as possible. The other thing I think we're really looking forward to is um, increasing our thought leadership. We have amazing founders. Jonathan Haidt wrote The Coddling of the American Mind. He's one of our founders. He has a new book coming out on March 26th called The Anxious Generation. And there are three chapters about let grow as 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 the action you can take um, for for some of the things that he explores. He explores a lot of the causes. Um, and so we know that's coming up. We're getting we're getting more attention in the therapy from therapists. Uh, that article came out and Dr. Ortiz uh, wrote a fairly simple therapy manual mm. for clinicians. He's offering that free. Uh, we jumped in and said, hey, I've got the technology and the automated processes to make that happen. Because mm -hmm. I think that he would have probably gone nuts. Uh, he's had over 1,100 requests for that therapy manual since, since that article first came out on September 4th. And we've been able to automate that all for him and get this out to people. So I think we're really looking to build that awareness. We want to be on the national stage. We want people talking about this. We want to see a big part of it is passing more reasonable childhood independence laws, which is kind of our third main program. We do parents, we do schools, uh, and we're also working on legislation because there are unfortunately, some laws out there that make it a little too easy to um, prosecute uh, and investigate a parent that simply let their child go to the park by themselves because they felt they were capable and somebody called the cops. So we've passed that the reasonable independence law in eight states so far. Um, and I feel like that's those are some dominoes that are starting to to fall a little more easily. So we very much hope to get that uh, in more and more states across the country. Um, I doubt we'll ever get a national law on it, but um, you know. We're uh, federalist, it's okay. We, so we, we can, can, we can, exactly. There's there's a whole, there's a, a whole lot of that, that it, it should be up to the states and the states are, um, are doing uh, some really good work. And the beauty of it is it's nonpartisan. It's, or bipartisan, I should mm. say. In most states, we are getting bipartisan support, frequently unanimous, um, and it's it's wonderful to have anything that, <laughs> that that the red states and the blue states can agree on. Hundred percent. That's amazing. And when I think back to my childhood, I think back to the times of my parents worrying that someone's going to call CPS because I'm out there, you know, doing my own thing with my bro uh -huh. kid brother. And and so yeah, I, that's that's a fear that. I'm so glad you're addressing because, you know, oh, it's, it's important because it's a legitimate fear. There are some horror stories mm -hmm. uh, of and they find us frequently. Um, some of these parents that are in these ridiculous situations. Uh, so as a matter of fact, that reminds me, I have a volunteer I need to talk to. Um, she's uh, she ended up with a plea deal and uh, they gave her like, so many hours of community service, but they have no um, parameters as to who that is, as so long as it's a nonprofit. So ah. she's gonna, so <laughs> she's gonna, she's gonna help us with some of our legislative work. Uh, we thought that was kind of fun. <laughs> I love it. Oh, the irony. <laughs> oh, we were like, yes, let's stick it to them. Really, yes, we can totally, we could totally get you those volunteer hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Well, you know, I'm sorry, the time has flown way yeah. by. It's it's wonderful to get to chat with you. I just have one last question. Um, can you nominate anyone for me to interview next here on Neighbors in the Network? Oh, well, um, I can nominate whether they're available. Uh, I think that um, Peter Gray, one of our co-founders, he's an expert on play. Uh, and he is... Um, he, he's amazing. He's a wonderful speaker. And he is in the process specifically uh, uh, of a study in New Hampshire uh, that is studying <clears throat> Play Club and our independence project uh, in some schools 
against some schools that don't have them. And that's very hard to do because nobody wants to be a control group and not give their kids the program yeah. um, in a school. But uh, so so I would definitely uh, recommend him. And I might have a couple others if you give me a little time to get back to you. OK, great. Yes, absolutely. Let's let's just keep this conver conversation going in whatever okay. means we have moving forward. Absolutely. OK. Well, thank you so much. I learned so much and I'm so excited to learn more and uh, I'm sure our listeners will feel the same way. So I really appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you, James. Thanks for listening to Neighbors in the Network, an offering from the State Policy Network. We hope that this podcast can serve as a place for empathy, understanding, and human connection. Please let us know about your thoughts in the comments section. And thanks again.